Well, our next speaker doesn't need really an extensive introduction. It's Elia Dashi, who has uh, spent his life in promoting and developing further and further our knowledge in basic uh, processes in the ovary. I want, though, to go through his awards. He has an honorary doctoral degree from Poznan University, an honorary degree from Ottawa, honorary professorship in Shandong, in Jin from Shandong University in Jinan, a Master of Arts from Brown, Fellow of the Royal College, President d'honneur uh, titre étrangère, member the, of the National Academy of Medicine, member of the Association of American Physicians, and fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science. For the past few years, we, we have this award that uh, Teresa Woodrow won this year, and every year, Dr. Adashi was nominated. But it wasn't just his last 10 years. He was mostly administrator and writing sort of philosophical papers. So this gave us a reason to establish a new award, a Career Achievement Award, a Lifetime Achievement Award for our society. Even though we had him in mind, it wasn't necessarily that he was going to win it. And what happened was, within minutes from when the posting was made, there was a nomination. So, Ellie, we have a surprise for you. We want to award you the first Lifetime Achievement Award from the SRM. One second to get everything together for, for Ellie, who's going to talk to us about editing the human germline, so near and yet so far. Mr. President, members of the society, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm literally speechless, certainly unprepared, but very appreciative. And thank you very much for this very fine surprise. I also much appreciate the opportunity to address you today. Uh, it's both an honor and a privilege. In 1963, Joshua Lederberg, one of the finest minds to grace this nation, and a Nobel Prize awardee for the discovery of bacterial conjugation, wrote in Man and His Future, we might anticipate the in vitro culture of germ cells and the direct control of nucleotide sequences in human chromosomes, coupled with recognition, selection, and integration of the desired genes. In hindsight, we can only speculate as to the functionality envisioned by Professor Lederberg, which in all likelihood represented something that we would refer to today as word processing, if you will, wherein we replace one letter with another, sometimes one word with another, and at yet other times a whole paragraph with one another, using relatively simple commands, such as cut and paste. Transmuted to the genome editing arena, the construct envisioned by Professor Lederberg 
almost certainly would have permitted the substitution of one base for another, perhaps one gene or parts of a gene with another, using again relatively simple commands such as delete, which would give rise to a knockout, or delete and insert, which would give rise to a knock-in. To be sure, the search for genome editors has been underway since the early 80s. And for all practical purposes, it is ongoing as we speak. Leading that pack were the meganucleases, which before too long gave rise to zinc finger nucleases, which in turn were substituted by the so-called talens or transcription activator-like effector nucleases, and of course more recently have given way to CRISPR-Cas9 and its congeners. What sets CRISPR-Cas9 endonuclease apart from its predecessors is its supreme targetability, fidelity, malleability, and versatility. It was only 2012 when CRISPR-Cas9 was revealed to be a bacterial genome editing system concerned with antiviral immunity by professors Dudna and Charpentier from UC Berkeley and Umeå University, respectively, as well as by Professor Sixnis from Vilnius University. It was only a year later that CRISPR-Cas9 was repurposed so as to serve as a eukaryotic genome editing system by Professor Dudna yet again, but also by Professor Kim from Seoul National University and by Professor Zhang and Church from MIT and Harvard University respectively. And so was born the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution, which all but exploded onto the scene, with a number of peer-reviewed publications predicted for 2018 exceeding 4,000 in all. By December of 2015, Science Magazine designated CRISPR-Cas9 its breakthrough of the year, which meant that Nobel Prize awards to a yet-to-be-determined contingent of scientists was just a matter of time. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? To answer this question, I would like to play for you a very brief videotape which seeks to do justice to this very question. Since being discovered in a bacterial immune system, CRISPR-Cas9 has been adapted into a powerful tool for genomic research. There are two components to the system, a DNA cutting protein called Cas9 and an RNA molecule known as the guide RNA. Bound together, they form a complex that can identify and cut specific sections of DNA. First, Cas9 has to locate and bind to a common sequence in the genome called a PAM. Once the PAM is bound, the guide RNA unwinds part of the double helix. The RNA strand is designed to match and bind a particular sequence in the DNA. Once it's found the correct sequence, Cas9 can cut the DNA. Its two nuclease domains each make a nick, leading to a double strand break. The double strand break just mentioned, or DSB for short, is at the heart of what we call DSB dependent editing, which is the sole means we currently have to repair multibase mutations, for example, in the human embryo, using homology directed repair, or HDR for short, which in somatic cells would rely on the exogenously provided DNA template 
but in zygotes may well rely on the endogenous wild-type allele should such exist. The problem with DSB-dependent editing is that it triggers non-HDR DNA repair mechanisms, such as non-homology end joining, which gives rise to small stochastic on and off target insertions and deletions, also known as indels, but also to large on target deletions and complex rearrangements. For these reasons and more, interest has been growing in so-called DSB independent editing, a technique that would allow us to repair single base mutations in human embryos using so-called base editors that have the capacity to replace CG pairs with TA counterparts or AT pairs with GC counterparts. How this remarkable technology operates is briefly illustrated in the next videotape. But making double-strand breaks isn't all CRISPR can do. Some researchers are deactivating one or both of Cas9's cutting domains and fusing new enzymes onto the protein. Cas9 can then be used to transport those enzymes to a specific DNA sequence. In one example, Cas9 is fused to an enzyme, a deaminase, which mutates specific DNA bases, eventually replacing cytidine with thymidine. This kind of precise gene editing means you could turn a disease-causing mutation into a healthy version of the gene, or introduce a stop codon at a specific place. Which brings us to the main subject matter of our conversation today, editing the human germline. To get us started, it may do us some good to ask some very basic questions. For example, what is the objective of human germline editing? The simple and probably correct answer is to prevent disabling and life truncating monogenic maladies or as some have described it, transition from chance to choice. This is, of course, a lofty goal, which, if taken to its logical conclusion, would, in principle, rid humanity of the so-called monogenic scourge. Another basic question we may wish to ask ourselves, what universe do we envision occupying with this new technology? The moral conviction behind human germline editing notwithstanding, surely we do not have in mind to tackle the 10,000 or more human monogenic disorders that are presently listed in the online Mendelian Inheritance in Men. Rather, we are likely to take a more focused approach and go after edit suitable maladies. By that I mean maladies for which peri or postnatal medical therapy is infeasible, maladies for which peri or postnatal somatic editing is ineffective, maladies for which PGD is inutil or for that matter is associated with a rate limited embryo complement. And of course, genes or alleles that are highly penetrant, ideally singular, and of course, CRISPR accessible. The last basic question we may wish to ask ourselves has to do with the state of human germline editing today as we speak. The simple answer for which is nascent and as the subtitle of this presentation suggests, so near and yet so far. It was April 18, 2015, on the pages of Protein and Cell, that Professor Huang and his colleagues from Sun Yat-sen University reported the very first attempt 
to edit the human embryo, in this case using tripronuclear zygotes. In their work, Professor Huang and his associates focused on the wild-type beta-globin gene, being able to document low editing efficiency, minimal editing specificity, and limited editing uniformity, which is to say the absence of mosaicism. The limited scientific accomplishments, if you will, of this proof of principle contribution notwithstanding, this paper shook the foundations of the scientific community to its core and changed the course of history in many ways, some of which we will cover today, later on this afternoon. It is probably this contribution of this paper which led Nature magazine to include it in its year-end Nature's 10. In the wake of this proof of principle contribution, at least four other similar contributions saw press, all reliant on DSB-dependent editing. Yet addition of four articles saw press not too long after that, trying to capitalize on DSB-independent editing. All of these contributions, for the most part, represent proof of principle contributions. It was not until August the 24th, 2017, on the pages of Nature, that Professor Shukrat Mitalipov and his colleagues from Oregon Health and Science University embarked on the first significant and meaningful effort to assess the utility and feasibility of germline editing in the human embryo. In their quest, Professor Mitalpov and his colleagues focused on an autosomal dominant malady known as familial hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is attributable to a mutant sarcomere gene. As you can imagine, this malady is incurable, and though amenable to symptomatic care, all too often ends up with sudden cardiac death. To explore the feasibility of correcting this gene mutation, Professor Mitalpov and his colleagues carried out two distinct sets of experiments. In the first, intact O2 or M2 oocytes were fertilized with mutant sperm, edited 18 hours later, and the results analyzed in the day three cleavage stage embryo. In the second series of experiments, intact M2 oocytes were both ICSI fertilized and edited at the time of fertilization, and the results analyzed in the day three cleavage stage embryo. As shown, Editing of zygotes 18 hours post-fertilization increased the representation of wild-type homozygosity to 67%, accompanied by a mosaicism rate of 24%. However, when editing of zygotes was carried out at the time of fertilization, the relative representation of wild-type homozygosity now increased to 72%, and the mosaicism rate substantially decreased to 2.4%. On-target indels were noted and documented in both circumstances. Taken together, these observations clearly suggest that zygotic editing at fertilization enhances editing efficiency and uniformity, if not specificity, but that further optimization will clearly be required if clinical application is to be entertained. Which brings us to an all-important fork in the proverbial road 
to mutation-free embryo transfers. One road could lead to selection via PGD in the day three cleavage stage embryo. The second road could lead to zygotic editing at the fertilization stage. These two technologies could not be more different from one another. Selection via PGD is of course entirely diagnostic in nature and is well beyond editing, which is to say we do not at present have a technology that allows us to edit the multicellular human embryo. Zygotic editing, on the other hand, is of course entirely restorative in nature and is all about editing. Neither technology is without its relative shortcomings. PGD, for example, was recently shown to display a significant retrieval to transfer falloff when screening for dominant or recessive disorders. In the case of dominant disorders, 30% of retrievals did not culminate in transfers. In the case of recessive disorders, 20% of retrievals never ended up in transfers. This phenomenon is taken to a level of absurdity when one tries to identify savior siblings, where in the fall off from retrieval to transfer is an atrocious 90% or higher, in this case in all likelihood due to advanced maternal age. These findings suggest that selection via PGD, though broadly applicable, is certainly ill-suited for circumstances characterized by rate-limiting complements of embryos and in rare parental constellations wherein we are all but assured that all the resultant embryos will be universally affected. Zygotic editing, on the other hand, may be uniquely suited for circumstances wherein we face rate-limiting complements of embryos. Although we must realize that when we do so, we expose both mutant and intact zygotes to the editing mix, the significance of which, if any, will have to be carefully evaluated. Beyond that, I am sure all of you realize that what will be required at some point is some form of pre-transfer validation of whole embryo editing rigor, that is to say, validation or quality control or quality assurance of the editing process that just transpired. This might take the form of cell-free DNA in embryo conditioned media, or it might require altogether new non-invasive assessment technology that is yet to be developed. Finally, consideration should probably also be given to a future third road, a part and distinct from selection via PGD or zygotic editing. Reference is being made here to editing of stem cell derived human gametes in the context of IVG or in vitro gametogenesis, which is making huge strides as you know, and frankly is just a matter of time at this point before it becomes a reality. Should that technology materialize, it would afford us with unique quality control and will all but assure the absence of mosaicism. That would be an ideal combination at some point down the line. These technical challenges notwithstanding, we must not lose sight of several other challenges that clearly will have to be negotiated before this technology ultimately arrives in the clinic. These challenges are statutory in nature, regulatory in nature, ethical in kind, religious in some cases, and societal in the sense 
of deep societal unease and disquietude, not just with respect to human germline editing, but frankly, to any new scientific breakthrough. In the United States, the statutory challenge has to do with a recurrent annual rider that prohibits the FDA from adjudicating research in which a human embryo is intentionally modified to include heritable genetic modification. This law effectively precludes any clinical trials of human germline editing in the United States with the approval of and under the watchful eye of the FDA. Assuming statutory relief is achieved, which is not certain, one would still have to negotiate the regulatory bar and document the usual safety and efficacy under the authority of the FDA. That presently, obviously, is infeasible. Ethical concerns about human germline editing abound and have been the subject of discussion now for half a century. A sampling of those is only shared here. One important one is the so-called loss of disability pride by certain disability communities, such as deaf culture, who would in many ways would like to hold on to what they developed over the years and not universally embrace this new technology. We always must keep in mind the prospect of state-led eugenics, which is not all that far historically from where we stand today, and we always must be sure that that does not transpire. There is, of course, the matter of heritability of edits, the fact that this technology reverberates down the generations because whatever change we effect will, of course, materialize down the line. And then there is the debatable point of progeny rights and consents, the notion that would-be progeny were never consulted, let alone consented, a point that ethicists often enjoy discussing. In sectarian contexts, we must anticipate religious concerns. Those will mostly focus on sanctity of human life, in this case, the embryo, the dignity of procreation, what some perceive to be the hubris of human infinitude, or worse, usurpation of divine power, so-called playing God. And then there is a pervasive sense of societal disquietude whenever a new scientific breakthrough comes along. This is true for humanity throughout its long history. For the most part, this is a fear of the imponderable, fear of the unknown and the unfamiliar, of revising the laws of nature, of tampering with creation, of altering the natural order, a fear that tends to be resistant to cerebral arguments in that it is very visceral and very emotional in nature, having observed millennia of tradition in reproductive uh, life that is now taken apart and changed altogether. There's really only one way to get around societal disquietude, and that is to engage society in a constructive and meaningful conversation on this new technology. This is what every real democracy must do. As the National Academy of Medicine framed this a year ago, this will take the form of participatory public engagement. And as the Nuffield Council on Bioethics from the UK framed it, this will entail broad and inclusive societal debate. This is not something we do well in the United States. We haven't done this well before. We have always relied on experts. Europe is way ahead of us on this one, and we would do well 
to learn from them on this and related phenomena. Which brings us to the question of how do we move forward? How do we get to the point where the positive and constructive aspects of human germline editing actually can materialize? Fortunately, as I alluded to earlier, humanity has a long experience with scientific breakthroughs and the sequence that humanity goes through when such occurs. There is a certain predictable series of developments that follow the appearance of a breakthrough in a leading journal. This was first systematically tackled by Dr. Kuhn, who wrote this up in 1962 in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. While there are many lessons to be taken from that particular contribution, perhaps the most important one was his defining of the universal ingredients of accidents, which is to say the minimum requirements that would have to be met for society to accept, possibly embrace a new technology. And while there are many ingredients of accidents, I will mention two. Time is perhaps the most important one. Recall that IVF, now 40 years old, had to encounter monumental difficulties long before Louise Brown was born and long after that. That was true of almost every scientific breakthrough, especially in the reproductive arena. It takes time. And when I say time, I think generational time. It may not be our generation that ends up accepting and or embracing human germline editing. It might be our children or grandchildren who in fact see this as perfectly normal, quite routine, and nothing special. In fact, when you ask your grandchild about human germline editing and he or she returns your question with a blank stare, you know that you have arrived. They don't know what you're talking about. What's so special about this? It wouldn't hurt to have some form of stupendous success along the way. Let's just say complete elimination of the Huntington gene from the human gene pool. Who could argue with that? Opposition would melt overnight the technology would be embraced wholeheartedly in no time. Of course, this may not happen or will not happen, but that is a cure to any uh, objection to novel scientific technology. Ultimately, of course, this all translates to a cultural change that occurs over time. And while I did say that cultural change for the most part is time dependent and could be generational, I'd like to share with you some example of a quicker cultural change best manifested by the evolution of Professor Dudna herself, the mother of CRISPR-Cas9, if there ever was one, who proceeded from a relatively conservative view vis-a-vis -vis germline editing to a more accepting and permissive outlook. These are her views as expressed last year in the Aspen Festival of Ideas. Here's what she had to say. And this, and this was a surprise to me, actually, but I found my own attitudes about editing the germline changing over time. Um, because, you know, for, for many reasons, I guess I started thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, after all, we, you know, we pick our, our, our partners and we, we have kids so that some level we're you know, we're, we're affecting our, our kids just by our choice of partner. And yet I was getting uh, contacted, and, and this happens now routinely, by patients, families, uh, parents who reach out and say, I have this disease in my family. A lot of them send pictures of their children, very you know, beautiful children, and uh, they're facing a dev devastating disease. And you know, that, that hits you very, very deeply. And you start to ask, well, if this technology were available in a way that prevented that kind of suffering, why would we not want to use it? 
Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for staying the course. I think you all recognize that we are all very privileged to live in a time when a technology such as germline editing is struggling to make it to the fore, alongside some other very exciting developments in reproductive medicine you all know about. But with privilege also comes an awesome responsibility to do it right. And while there are many ways to do it right, I'd like to conclude with the articulation of, yet again, the Nuffield Council uh, of Bioethics from the United Kingdom, which said the following. Whatever we do, it must be consistent with the welfare of a person who may be born. Also, whatever we do, we must uphold the principles of social justice and solidarity. Thank you very much. Ellie, on behalf of the Society, want to give you a small memento for this talk. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you all very much, and this concludes this plenary session. <laughs>